Hey, what's up? Ed here. Just wanted to give you a quick note before the podcast starts that Mark did have some connection issues in the early going. He does uh, change rooms at the 27 minute mark. Before that mark, it's not unintelligible. It's, it's definitely fine. But if you're really having a hard time with it, you can skip to that 27 minute period in the video and it'll be crystal clear from there on. This is one of my favorite podcasts I've ever done. It was a really excellent interview. Mark is super knowledgeable and an angel, and you're definitely going to enjoy it if you listen to it. So just uh, stick through it. I don't want to lose any listeners because of connection issues, uh, but it does, you know, peak around that point, and then it gets better from there. Okay, so enjoy. And we're we're off. Hello, it's uh, Ed Gallo here. Another episode of the Wrestling for MMA podcast. Uh, if you listen to last week, this will be very different than last week. We had Dennis Bermudez on. That was one of the crazier interview experiences of my life. So definitely a departure from from the tone of that interview. Hopefully you enjoyed that. And if you didn't listen to that, I recommend it. And then the week before that, we did talk to Hudson Taylor, uh, which was awesome. And he talked a lot about uh, his nonprofit, uh, Athlete Ally. And I think we're going to get into similar territory today in terms of charity and nonprofit work. So that'll be great. I uh, love to see, you know, prolific athletes who are giving back in uh, ways that aren't directly related to sports, which is really cool. Uh, but yeah, if you're not listening on video, you will you won't know that our guest this week is a UFC veteran and a NCAA champion, Mark Munoz. Uh, so Mark, thank you for joining us. And we also have, uh, again, if you listen to last week, we have uh, Philippe Marchetti, uh, our French boxing and MMA genius. So hello, hello to both of you. Hi, thank you, Head. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thanks for having me on the call. Yeah, and if if you can't see, uh, if you're not watching the video version, Mark's got a little home office set up, and he's got uh, wrestling dummies and heavy bags and mats, and he's all ready to go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> he's all set for quarantine. No, yeah. no people required. That's right. That's right. Cool. Actually, I got my son. I got my son throwing me around, man, because he's in college now. So, mm-hmm. and he weighs—he weighs about, you know, he weighs over one ninety now. So he's—he's a—he's a, he's a beast. <laughs> so I'm working out with him. Mm-hmm. Where's he wrestling? He's at Arizona State. Oh wow! Is this his uh, redshirt year, technically? Yeah, this is his redshirt year. Oh, that's gonna be awesome. So you see him yeah. slotting in at like one eighty four, one ninety seven, that range. Uh, we'll see. He's thinking about going down to 174 right now Whoa. because um, <laughs> he's, got, he's got upperclassmen there in front of him. Mm-hmm. But I mean, once he starts working out, he'll get down. I mean, I, I like feeding him, so um, <laughs> so he's, he's he's big right now. And once he starts working out, I'm sure he'll he'll get he'll get more leaner. Sure, I guess uh, he Valencia's probably got another year at 184. Yep. All right, yeah. so that's, that'll be a tough spot to take. <laughs> and then Cordell, Cordell North Northfleet is actually mm-hmm. seven, so they're they're tough. They're tough at eighty four and ninety seven. So for sure, seventy four is what he's got to get to right now to to you know just just to be a, a good part of the team, you know. Mm-hmm. For sure, and I think Anthony Valencia is still one sixty five. So that I guess that that is the hole is one seventy four. So you might as well that's try to right. slot in. That's right. That's right. Cool. Yeah. So before we get too deep on just you know tangential wrestling talk, let's uh, let's get to <laughs> the structured part of the interview. So you know everybody who's who's watched or read any of my interviews knows if I talk to a wrestler, I start the same way. It goes the same way every time because I think wrestling is yeah. a journey, and uh, it, it really makes sense to go in order when you're talking about a wrestling career. So yeah, just from from the little research I did, uh, it seems like you got a pretty late start in the sport. So how did that happen? How did you get a start? And what were you doing beforehand that you think might have helped? Yeah. So I, um, I, I grew up playing football and I played basketball and, um, not organized too much in basketball, but I played pop Warner football since I was in third grade. So, uh, I thought I was going to be a San Francisco 49er when I, (laughs) when I grew up, I had, had, um, aspirations to, to become a NFL football player. Um, but then in the eighth grade, um, that's when it all changed for me. Um, in the eighth grade, I, I end up uh, getting bullied um, for for my shoes, uh, which were Jordans. And um, I, uh, yeah, I got bloody, battered, and beat up 
for for the shoes that I had on my feet. So, um, so then I I um, I faked being sick for about three days, and finally my parents were like, "Hey, go back to school. You're not sick." And I'm like, "Dad, I I don't want to. I, I I'm sick, Dad. I don't want to." Uh, and I was like stuttering, you know, um, sick, Dad. <laughs> You know, so he's like, nope, go back to school. So um, an interesting interesting uh, statistic is 160,000 students get bullied every day in the United States of America. 160,000. That's, that's an astronomical number. And so if mm-hmm. you do that times the number of days you're in school, it's in the millions, you know, tens of millions. So um, so it's, it's a big part of to, to say unfortunately uh, a lot of people get bullied today you know mm-hmm. um so so i want to be able to bring awareness to that you know mm-hmm. so, um so anyways on with my story so i got bullied and then um i uh i faked being sick i didn't want to go to school and then my my dad said go back to school so i, I went to school and and when i went to school i um I didn't want to look anybody in the eye. I was, I was walking and looking down because if I felt like, um, if I saw somebody, they saw me. And so I, I didn't want to be seen. I wanted to be invisible at the time. Right. And so, um, during lunch period, which, you know, we tend to have a break for lunch period, mm-hmm. um, there were about 20 minutes. I went up to a classroom and, you know, a couple of my buddies were there and they were like, Hey man, Munoz, man, where, where them Jays at? Where them Jays at, man? And I'm like, oh, man, I didn't feel like wearing them today, man, because I didn't want to tell them. I, I wanted, I wanted to suppress that memory into my, I guess, into myself as much as possible and and forget about it, you know. But um, but he kept asking, kept asking, and just kept being irritating, and I just had this like overwhelming emotion of anger in me. <laughs> And it was just welling up. And finally, I stood up from the desk and I clenched my fists at him. And I was like, hey, I didn't feel like wearing my Jason, man. Chill out, you know. And so, and he was like, whoa, calm down, Munoz, man. All I want to know where your Jason were at, man. Chill out, you know. And, uh, and, then, I, and then from there, I told him the story. And um, he was like, oh, man, I'm sorry. Um, I didn't know. And... Uh, and then he put his arm around me. He says, "I got your back." And I was like, "No, nah, you ain't got my back, man. Shoot, you're not gonna be there, twenty four and seven, dude. Like, mm-hmm. you're not gonna have my back all all day, every day." And he's he's like, turns turns away and he looks up at me. He goes, "Hey, you need to you need to learn how to wrestle." I go, "Wrestle? No, nah, man. You guys were tight lead tards and touch each other in funny places, man. I'm cool with that, right?" And he goes, "What? You think that's funny?" I go, nah, man, that's just what you do, homie. I'm good. I'm good, man. He goes, I bet you I could take you down in 10 seconds. I said, yeah, right. You're barely five foot nothing and 100 pounds, and I'm five foot six, 150 pounds. No way you can take me down, right? So anyways, we go into the hallway from that classroom, and um, I break down on my stance, and I'm with my fingers like I'm going to do magic or something. I'm like, what's up, homie? <laughs> what you got? What you got, right? He shoots in, two seconds flat, picks me up, and a double leg slams me on my back. And I've been wearing a tie ever since, right? <laughs> but it's not called leotard, right? It's not called leotard. It's called singlet. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's like that up. Because uh, I, I mean, I was ignorant. I didn't know. But. Now I've been wearing it in England ever since then. Uh-huh. I went to the first day of practice, and I was like, "Man, uh, I love. I, I need to. I need to learn this, right?" And so, but before that, before that, I went up to my dad, and I said, "Dad, what do you think about me? Me wrestling?" Um, he goes, "Okay, yeah, you wrestle. You wrestle the first day and the last day, and every day in between." I go. For sure, for sure, right? And for those of you, for for those of you that are on this podcast, how many of you guys remember your first day of practice? Was it good yes, or was it bad? <laughs> you know. So for me, this is how it went. Um, we went in and they showed us stance, uh, stagger stance. 
Um, they showed us a square stance. They showed us a penetration step. And then they showed us how to shoot a double leg on something. And then we were shooting the double leg. And we got to drill that for about mm, maybe 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. And then they were like, all right, guys. It's time to go situations, live situations. And I'm like, hey, live situations? Uh, I mean, what's... They're like, yeah, it's time to go live. I said, yeah, but I am alive. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, no, you're going to go 100% on each other. I'll put you in a double leg bullet so you guys go live. I go, oh, okay. I get it. I get it. All right. So so then um, I get a partner about my size, and and uh, he gets in on a double leg. And in my mind, I'm like, wait, how do I do They didn't. They didn't show the defense to this, uh-huh. you know? <laughs> so anyways, he starts picking me up and slamming me, and then I'm trying to get up. He cross-faces me, and I end up getting a bloody nose or a bloody leg. Uh-huh. And then uh, I'm trying to get up, and he slams me back to the mat. Like, Matt returns me. I'm like, oh, my God. This is not what I thought it was going to be, right? This is my first day. My first day. Um, and I don't know what they were doing with wrestling the first day, but... Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't want to go back, you know. And so, the next the next day, my I was like, my dad came home early, coincidentally, coincidentally, came home early, looks at his watch, says, "Hey, Mark, it's a three thirty. How come you're not? How come you're in practice?" I go, "Uh, Dad, I, um, I, I don't feel like wrestling anymore." He goes, "What?" <laughs> By the arm. Just marches to the car, opens the door, throws me in the car, drives to the school, presents me in front of the coach, and says, hey, Coach Minahan, Mark Munoz is here. See you later, and just walks out. <laughs> I'm like, no, Dad. Gosh, dang it. I go, look, oh, man, this sucks, you know? And then Minahan is like, hey, Munoz, get in there. Get a partner. I'm like, oh, shoot. You know, so, we're getting a partner, and and long story short, it was hard. It mm-hmm. was hard for me. Like I, I didn't want to stick with it. And then um, my friends actually actually helped me out a lot. They helped me out. They, um, you know, we we actually went to a middle school or junior high at the time. What was called a junior high, and mm-hmm. that was five miles away from the school. And so we had to hit hit to ride. And so they're like, "Hey, Mark, you coming? You coming? You coming?" And so. I didn't feel like I don't want to let them down, you know. So I was like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll come, you know. Nice. So I would just go with them, and then by the end of the year, I was going to all the upperclassmen. I was going with the juniors and the seniors in varsity, and I was in eighth grade. So, uh, and then by the end of my high school career, I was a two-time state champion, high school national champ. I take second in junior worlds, mm-hmm. and um, I uh, ended up getting a full ride scholarship to Oklahoma State University. So that's right. into it, man, and kind of how it led me up to uh, to college. During that that time when you're progressing, you know, from not knowing what you're doing, starting out not really enjoying it, to becoming a champion, a two time champion in probably top three toughest states to place at in the country, California, because it's just the one state class system, so it's one state tournament. Yeah. Um, what do you think were the were the keys to your success in high school? Like, how did you make that jump so quickly? Because you're competing with guys who started when they were six years old, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I started when I was 13. And so mm-hmm. um, what was difficult for me was not understanding uh, what was being done to me. Because mm-hmm. there's techniques in wrestling. Like, you can't just fight. There's like... There's nothing you can do if people know how to use their locks, their holds, their leverages, their tie-ups. Their, their, there's, there's nothing you can do because you don't know how to hold something. You don't know how to grip something. You don't know how to position your body or your head to be able to uh, defend. You know, and so you got to know all those things. You know, and so, um, and so as I started, as I started learning technique. And I started asking questions about um, about uh, coach. I, I got scored on from here. How do I stop that? And then he taught me like step by step, like what to do. And then, mm-hmm. and then slowly but surely, I started defending. Then I started scoring, and I started noticing like, oh wow, you know, this is there's 
there's actual technique that's involved in learning something, you know. So, um, so there was a lot of failure. There was a lot of failure. There was a lot of struggle. But I always tell all my wrestlers, and I coach, I coach a lot of wrestlers and a lot of fighters. I say, you know, you gotta, you gotta embrace the struggle, but not only embrace the struggle and try to get through it, but you gotta understand what's what's holding you back. Mm-hmm. You know, so you got to understand why you didn't score in a certain situation so you can make it better, you know. So, um, so failure is going to happen. I don't want you not shooting. I don't want you not attacking. I don't want you to um, just feel like you have to be defensive the whole time because I want you to be offensive too. Mm-hmm. You know, I want you to learn how to score from every position and not just being defensive. So, you know, so I make people shoot. I make people attack. I make people um, – get a tie up and move their feet and I do all of that stuff. So um for me like the improvement came from understanding how to why the people those four those four things, four questions you want to ask. The what you're doing, why do you the the when to do it, the how it works, and the why it works. Right. Those are four things that you need to understand. Of the technique you're being shown because mm-hmm. once you do that then you understand the ins and outs of the move and so you're going to hit it you're going to be more happy to hit it rather than doing what the coach says for you to do you know mm-hmm. you don't understand it you know? so <clears throat> you got to know the what the how the when and the why in order to for it to be yours makes sense yeah for sure so that's, that's what that's what kind of i had a pull to me because I hated losing, man. Like, I, I, I didn't want to lose. I didn't. Um, I just, I made sure that I, I tried my hardest every time. And when I was going with a senior, when I was an eighth grader, he was like, man, I don't want to go with that kid next year. That kid is going to be tough, you know? So I was like, I'm getting somewhere. Because I noticed, like, I would touch somebody's leg, and then they would sprawl me, get around me, and then cross face me again. I'm like, dang it. Then I get around it. They sprawl me. And they sprawl me. Then all of a sudden, I'm like picking it up, but they defend it. You know, so I, I was progressing, but mm-hmm. I, I wasn't scoring yet. But then in that progression, in that struggle, I was able to get a lot tougher, and um, and that's how it happened, man. And and um, that that grit, that determination, as well helps. That aggression helps as well um, because you can't. You can't tuck your tail in between your legs and just walk away, right? You mm-hmm. gotta wrestle. You gotta wrestle. So that's that's how that's what happens for me. Nice. Yeah, that's awesome. And like you're you're definitely appealing to us and our audience right now because I think uh, our our audience is full of elitists. You know, what I mean, like we're all like technique snobs, and we always prefer, almost always prefer the guys who like seem to have like a, a deeper knowledge of the sport they're competing in than, than other guys and. My hypothesis right now is that maybe starting later in a sport can sometimes give you the push to be more of a technician and be and approach it more academically because you had to catch up, you know what I mean? So you had to like study, study, study and yep. constantly be getting better. Um, right. So you, you end up in the Oklahoma State room. I, I believe John Smith's coaching there at the time uh, as yeah. head coach at that point. Um, you're working out with guys like Daniel Cormier and uh, I think Mo LaBall might have been there around that time. Oh, uh, this, uh, I recruited Mo. You recruited Mo. That's there's awesome. A lot of stories that I got, bro. I mean, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of stories I got at Oklahoma State. So, uh-huh. but yeah, I, I, I mean, I got there. There was Pat Smith for the 1996 Olympics. There was uh, Mark Branch, Eric Guerrero, Teague Moore. There was uh, Smith. Um, there was um, Hardell Moore. I mean, these these are guys. Uh, Jamel Kelly. It's ridiculous. Uh, was a silver medalist. <laughs> there was a uh, Reggie Wright, who was a three-time All-American. There was, I mean, national champs, All-American, World Team members, Olympic champions. Man, you name it, they were on that team. So it's no surprise that you got a lot better. <laughs> You're working out with super, super <laughs> tough guys every day. Oh my gosh, dude! Dude, I got four. So here's one, right? I'm. I'm I, Get recruited. I'm from state, and um, <laughs> you know, I uh, I get off. I go. 
up to my point in time, and I'm like, I'm going to school, right? And I'm like, uh, dude, I'm, just, I'm sad because I'm leaving home for the first time, right? So I'm like bawling on the airplane, like, mm-hmm. <laughs> leaving home, right? Next thing you know, I get off the plane, and then I see a cowboy, and I'm from, I'm from California, you know? Right. I, I've never seen a, a live cowboy in my whole life, you know? I see a cowboy with a cow. I see a cowboy, a guy in a cowboy hat, Wrangler jeans, a big belt buckle, <laughs> cowboy boots, and a flannel shirt. And I'm like, wow, that's a real life cowboy. That's crazy. Yeah. And he has my name on on a sign in for Munoz. And I'm like, oh. So I go up to him. I say, hey, sir, I'm Marlon. He goes, huh? Got this. He's got this. And he's spitting in it. And it's about half full, <laughs> and he's he's got a big old, big old bump on his side of his cheek. He's like, huh? You Mark Munoz, huh? You Mark Munoz, you mind me asking? You can top Mexican? I said, no, Mexican. I thought there's only one type. <laughs> oh my gosh, right? It's crazy. So right when I get off the airplane, it was like I see that. He asked me that. I was like, oh, man, I don't know how this is going to be. Then he goes, I'm fixing to take you to Stillwater. Coach Smith, you ready to go? I go, oh, okay, let's go. Right? <laughs> so I drive, and it's like I'm listening to this twanging music, rang, 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 country music, right? I'm like, oh, wow, never listened to country, right? So anyways, I get to Oklahoma State, and I meet Coach John. I'm like, yeah, man, that's the guy on how low can you go videotapes when I was injured and I got a lot better mm-hmm. out because I went from I went from being a because uh, I made a Greco world team as a sophomore after yeah. two years of wrestling made a Greco world team, had a killer headlock and uh, and I'm getting to clinch so I made a world team as a, a sophomore and then I got injured and then someone gave this video cassette tape like a VHS for all you guys that don't know what that is. Um, <laughs> cassettes. I went into these. Anyways, um, I went to uh, uh, watch that. I became, and I started shooting high crotches and little single legs. Um, so that's what helped me become who I was as a, as a wrestler. Nice. Uh, and, uh, and so I mentioned, like, oh man, that's a two Olympic champion, six times world champion, mm-hmm. our best American wrestler in history. I'm like, that's a freaking coach. Oh, my gosh. I can't believe it. Okay. So, anyways, um, I was there, and, and dude, it was hard. I got, my first one was Pat Smith, and he kicked my butt. Wow. Like, freaking, <laughs> like, he's the first time NCAA national champ. Mm-hmm. I'm a friend. <laughs> oh, he kicked every day. Uh, it was bad. And then I had, you know, Hard Moore, who was a starting uh, 158 pounder. Um, it was just, it was like partner after partner on the game. Mm-hmm. So, um, but yeah, like I said, and you know, um, with parts like that, I can't, I can't help get better. Oh, for sure, for sure. Um, you know, just kind of jump it into your your first year as a starter there. Uh, you make the NCAA tournament and you're seated. You got the 11th seed in your first appearance. It's pretty solid. I had a, a quick question. In your first match, you beat a man named Brian Bowles. Yeah. This is 177 pounds. This is not the same Brian Bowles that fought at 135 in the WC, is it? No, it's different. I tried to figure that out and I couldn't find anything. I'm like, there's no way. Yeah. <laughs> different Brian Bowles. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't lose over 40 pounds. Yeah, that'd be insane. <laughs> like, he must have been yeah. wrestling his weight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Different. Yeah, I mean, I I, uh, I, may, I make it. I'm, you know, year 177. That was the weight class. So mm-hmm. after, my, after my sophomore year, or during my sophomore year, weight classes. But, I mean, I was weighing, I was weighing 200 pounds. Wow. Like 177. So, I mean, I was... And that was a time where you could uh, you could wait, and then a day later you'll wrestle. So it's the day before weigh-ins. Mm-hmm. So people plastics and cut weight, you know. And so 
Um, I was never losing weight ever. I mean, not like I did because after a two hour on the platform on a bike and go five off, well, after practice, dude, wrestling the likes of like national champions, all Americans, like you're dead tired, right? Right. And you have to put on this, you know, rubber suit so you can be sweating the whole time for, for about an hour after you get done, you know, like, dude. It's crazy, you know. And there's mm-hmm. these guys, part of more, um, uh, part of more. God bless his soul. I, uh, he goes, hey, Williams, just look up like this and pedal. You'll be fine, man. You'll be fine. <laughs> and I looked up, pedaled. I'm like, bro, this don't work. <laughs> you know, I'm like, this don't work, man. He was just, giving me, he was just trying to make me think some, think of different, right? Mm-hmm. But anyways. I ended up I ended up losing weight after the first day of the national tournament. I was eleven pounds over. Oh my god! Make weight again, <laughs> you know. So, yeah. So I was eleven seed, but like the second day, man, I was like done because, I mean, it was I had to lose too much weight the night before. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and you, I mean, you had a tough bracket as well. Uh, Greg Jones's brother, Avertis Jones, who was a, a three-time yeah. AA. He was in, on the front side for you, and on the back side, you had a. Uh, yeah, you know, the guy that took six, Javon Herman. So it, it was tough. And I think your bracket next year was even tougher. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I didn't all work in that year. I was, I was, uh, I was ranked top eight that year, too. So, mm-hmm. yeah. And shoot. I was cutting a lot of weight then, too. <laughs> yeah. You moved out to 184, right? Yeah. Well, 177 become 184. Mm-hmm. So, um, because the weight classes were, were one, 18, 120, uh, it was a 126, 130, uh, 130, 42, 158, mm-hmm. 177, 190 in heavyweight, right? So they changed it. The very next year, they changed it and gave about seven or eight pounds for every weight class. Gotcha. So then it became 125, 133, 141, 149, 157, you know. You know now you know so um that was that year that year when we transitioned from those weight classes so it froze in there hello yeah i hear you i hear you you're good okay yeah so uh jumping into sophomore year uh ranked seven seventh seed this time coming in little little higher seed uh, projected to all american uh, you got Kale Sanderson in this bracket, uh, Brandon Egham in this bracket, current Minnesota head coach, Virtus Jones again, Brad Veering, future future NCAA champion. And uh, in the blood round, you had to wrestle Andy Rovat, a uh, three-time All-American and a future Olympian. Uh, so <laughs> that, that was uh, a, a lot tougher than, than your first uh, trip to NCAAs, but you, you definitely improved uh, there but uh it, it really turns around in your junior year at, at ncaa's you're the number one seed at 197 pounds now a little closer to your natural weight it sounds like um yeah you know you majored your first match uh you went with tiebreakers with uh Ross, ross thatcher who ended up being pretty solid after college um but then you're you're upset in the semis uh and you have to you know wrestle back to win third so what in your mind what, what kind of happened there what do you remember from that tournament at junior year well i go into number one seed i beat Brad Varing, who won it that year, four times that year. Mm-hmm. Brad didn't beat. Um, I had issues, and we went we went back and forth with Zach Thompson. Um, mm-hmm. Zach Thompson was a guy, and I, I always had trouble with guys that were, like, shorter, that were stockier, and super strong. Right. And that, that was Zach Thompson, you know? And, uh, and he pretty much stayed in good position and would, like, not shoot and pretty much like just you know push me back would be like sumo wrestling i'm like man dang it like I, it was hard for me to like kind of figure him out you know um and uh and i lost him in the semis so and then i was just heartbroken i was like oh my gosh dude dude it's gonna be him and brad Baring and brad Baring's gonna win the national championship you know mm-hmm. 
uh, Brad didn't beat me that whole time that year. So, so <laughs> yeah, I was so upset, man. I was like, golly, man, this stinks, you know? Anyways, um, that's, that's what happened. And, and, um, yeah, Ross Thatcher was the same way. He was a, he was like a Greco guy and, um, super strong and underhooked, like the underhook and push people back, you know? So, um, that was the type of wrestler I had trouble with. But I ended up pulling him, pulling out that that match. Um, mm-hmm. That was the first time we wrestled him. So, um, but he was he was super tough mm-hmm. for me. But uh, but yeah. So um, that's that's uh, yeah. That and then I came back to take third, and um, I beat uh, Musha's Valley from Michigan State. Um, Georgian, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was awesome. He was a great wrestler. He was a senior that year. So, uh, but I mean, yeah, my junior year was depressing for me. It mm-hmm. was because I felt like I could have won it that year. For sure. And then, like, it's all, it's great that you win it as a senior. It's just the way it plays out is so interesting because you're number one seed again. Um, and you made your uh, Nick Fiquette, I think it's pronounced, he ends up being a, 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 a um, MMA fighter as well. Uh, yeah. Get a tech. He beat a uh, Nick Preston, who was super tough for Ohio State. Yeah, close match with him. Beat a uh, Owen Elson, another multiple time All American. Yep. And uh, on the other side of the bracket, you had Brad Veering again, number two seed. And then uh, Veering gets upset by this guy Pat Quirk, uh, yep. the seven seed. So <laughs> he ends yep. up uh, going to the finals. Uh, so the two seed ends up taking seventh, and the seven seed ends up going to the finals and taking second. And you have a five three match with this guy who is you know, projected to be a seventh place here. So just what do you remember from that tournament? I'm sure that was a, you know, happy, happy moment, but, you know, almost disappointing because you, you, you beat Veering so many times. And it would be nice to have, like, that name win at NCAAs. Yeah. You know, um, earlier in my career, though, Brad would kick my butt. Mm-hmm. Um, and I uh, started figuring him out a little bit more. And, and um, towards the end of my career, I was, you know, coming along. But Brad, dude, Brad was nails brad is you know what's cool about brad is um he was an amazing wrestler on the map but dude awesome person awesome. Mm-hmm. you know he's he's amazing but um but i started to uh you know get a lot more offense offense going on um when i started wrestling him so but in that tournament man i mean it was it was uh like you said, that that lineup of wrestlers that I had, dude. Yeah. I mean, it was going through the gauntlet, you know, um, of of wrestlers, you know. So, oh, and Ellison, I was able to um, go with go with him and and do really well, just because mm-hmm. of style matchup, you know. Um, Nick Preston was another one of those guys that likes to underhook and push people forward, sumo wrestle, you know. So I had had um, you know tough. Tough, uh, a tough go with him, but then, um, yeah, I end up, I end up, um, you know, doing, doing well, going to the finals and, and being Pat Quirk, you know, Pat Quirk is one of those, you know, sumo wrestler guys, but, you know, mm-hmm. I knew that if I scored on him early that he couldn't, he couldn't score on me later on in the match. Gotcha. <laughs> all he, all he could do was underhook and score mm-hmm. from the end. So, so I was like, I got two takedowns and I'm like, and he's a very defensive wrestler, so I didn't want to put myself in a position where he'd score on me. Gotcha. So I scored on him two takedowns in the first <laughs> period. It's like this dude's not That's scoring on me ever. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, uh, I'm good, you know. So, mm-hmm. so I, I mean, I, I pretty much was just like, uh, um, uh, not coasting, but like wrestling and just, yeah. just moving my feet and and doing all that stuff. So. Um, but yeah, that's that's how it went, and then then I won, I won in the finals, and and uh, yeah, it was uh, it was awesome. awesome. Mm-hmm. To get it done, yeah, and you're you're the caliber of guy that you know people could consider a multiple multiple time NCAA champ. So it's like a huge like what's you know what's Mark gonna do after college? And uh, I know freestyle and Greco, I, I guess could have been options for you just based on your background. Uh, so how how did that progress from going from from college to MMA? Was there a, a big in between where you were thinking about you know trying trying an Olympic run, world championship yeah, run? I, was, I mean, I, I did I did try out for the Olympics, um, 
And um, I made a national team four times. Um, but obviously, you know, Cormier made made a, a world Olympic team. So, and he was my teammate. Right. <laughs> uh, we had to wrestle each other, and he beat me. So, um, you know, Cormier, Cormier, um, he was the best man for the job, you know. So um, that was the time where I um, I got married. I got married and I started having kids. And so it was hard for me to leave um, home to be able to go to Olympic Training Center. So right. Cormier, Cormier was getting a lot better. And I was, you know, I was at home trying to train with college guys. And he was training with all the world team members and, and um, wrestling freestyle. And, and right. um, for me, it was uh, that that wasn't the case. But, um, but hey, I mean... Um, I ended up doing that for about um, a year and a half. And then, um, I ended up going to, uh, accepting a job at, uh, UC Davis mm -hmm. back to California where, where I met Uriah Faber, you know? So, and, uh, that year when I was, when I went to, um, when I went to Davis, it was 2003. So, um, I was still wrestling. You know, um, I still was part of the national team. And um, in 2004, it was Athens, you know. So And so I was, uh, I wrestled and, you know, to the top five at the U.S. Nationals. Nice. Um, and uh, made it to the Olympic trials. And, and then I was training and, and um, you know, I wanted to bring Uriah along with me. And so Uriah, Uriah Faber just graduated that year was coaching with me. And so I, I brought him to like different tournaments around the nation. And, uh, he, he was like, uh, you know, wanting to, wanting to wrestle as well. So, um, so Uriah, after one of the tournaments says, Hey Mark, you need to learn how to fight. And I'm like, I don't know what it is about me meeting shorter people telling me what to do. <laughs> but, but he was like, yeah, man, there's this new sport called MMA, mixed martial arts, and I think you'd be really good at it. I'm like, ah, I don't know, man. I'm teaching, coaching, getting my master's, and one more thing I want to play, man, I, I, I don't think I can handle. You know, I got a mm -hmm. wife and three kids at the time and one on the way. I'm like, dude, there's too much, you know. And he goes, man, you'll make a lot of money. You know, I'm like, ah, you know, <laughs> I don't know, man. I, I don't know if I can do it, you know, because – I got a lot on my plate. Anyways, he stayed on me, and he stayed on me for, I'd say, two or three years. I mean, he stayed on me for a long time. And he was like, I want you to come to the gym and just learn, how to, you know, just learn different things. You know, do jujitsu, you know, and I learned jujitsu, and then I learned some, you know, striking with some Muay Thai, and then I learned some, um, and then I learned some, uh, you know, boxing along with him over there. And I was training at the same time at a gym called Fairtex. Uh, mm -hmm. Fairtex, San Francisco, and um, you know Jake Shields. Um, gotcha. There was um, you know the, the whole uh, scrap pack. pack. You know, yeah. yeah the, <laughs> that pack, you know, Kilbert uh, Melendez, um, Nick and Nate Diaz. They were all there training. You know, and so um, so I trained with them for for the first first part of my career as well. You know, uh, a couple days a week. So. Um, you know, Gunya Fairtex was my Muay Thai coach in the beginning, and he was an unbelievable coach. Mm -hmm. um, and there's Johnson and Fairtex who was over there too, and and he was he would hold uh, mitts and pads for me as well. Those guys are just amazing, uh, yeah. Fairtex, the Fairtex guys. Um, so um, uh, to them, you know, because they they really helped me in the beginning, and then um, I learned different things and. And then I started putting putting them together, and then Uriah brought in uh, the who's who of the UFC: uh, Andy Couture, Brandon Vera, Quinn Rampage Jackson, Tito wow. Ortiz, wow. Uh, Frank Craig, James Irvin, Scott Smith. Like, it was amazing camp. And um, and uh, Randy Couture was getting ready to fight Tim Sylvia, um, I believe Tim Sylvia for um, to defend his belt. You know, and so I'm like, dude. These guys are amazing. And Uriah asked me to come. And I was like, yeah, I'll come. You know, so um, it was, it actually happened to be sparring day. And I'm like, ooh, dude, sparring. Like, I'm, I'm getting ready, I'm getting ready to fade away in the shadows and like kick mm -hmm. my feet up and 
popcorn and soda and watch it, right? <laughs> and it's, uh, Uriah comes with a pair of gloves, a pair of shin guards, and a headgear, and he goes, hey, bro, can you do me a favor? I'm like, heck no. I ain't going to walk in there with these killers. These, these, are, these are killers, man. He goes, no, man, you'll be fine, dude. All you got to do is double jab, double leg, you'll be fine. I'm like, double jab? What am I going to do? Like, close my eyes and do that? I could double leg all day, but, like, man, they're going to – they're gonna kick and punch you, punch me in the face. Like I don't know if I can do that, right? Mm-hmm. Anyways, my first everyone gets a partner, and then the one partner that the one guy that didn't have a partner was Randy Couture, <laughs> and he's like, and I end up partnering up with him, and then you know you rise like, hey, just think about jab, get your jab off, right? Jab off, get your get your shot in. So I was like, okay. Anyways, I'm like jabbing him, and I'm like surprising myself. I'm like, ooh, dude, I'm, jab- I'm landing my jabs, and I'm, like, snapping his head back. I'm like, whoa, this is crazy. I'm actually jabbing, jabbing him. And then classic Randy Couture gets the clinch, starts dirty boxing me, puts sweets me to my back, and, and I'm scrambling. I grab his leg, and, I mean, it was a scramble, you know. And, I, and there was one time where I grabbed both of his legs, like, ooh. And I'm like, and I have a really firm grip on the double leg. I'm like, dude. I'm taking this dude down. So <laughs> I took him down, and I'm, and I'm like ground and pounding, like raining punches from the heavens, like straight up Donkey Kong in him, right? And he's like, hey, 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 we don't go 100% in practice, man. I got to defend my belt in, in two weeks. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, I'm so sorry, right? And then uh, I lighten it up, and he gets up, underhooks me, puts me to my back, and like, and I'm like, wait, I thought we weren't supposed to do this, man. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Anyways, I had a time in my life, and he's like, "Man, you got, you got really good potential to to do really well in this sport. You should really consider doing it." And then your eyes like comes up to me. I told you, man. He like hits me in the chest. He goes, "I told you, man." So that's when I started training, and and about uh, just a little over a year, I got into the UFC because mm-hmm. I fought in the local circuit. I I, I skipped amateur altogether, and I went pro. I fought pro. I fought pro three times in kind of the local circuits mm-hmm. uh, and uh, fought PFC, which is Palace Fighting Championships. And I fought um, a King in the Cage or Gladiator Challenge, uh, my second fight. And then I fought PFC again. And then I got called up to the WEC. Mm-hmm. I fought twice in the WEC and the WEC got bought off by the UFC. I was one of those select few that actually came to the UFC from the WEC. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was like super fast. Like I ended up getting into the UFC after after about a year of training. <clears throat> so um, yeah, so that's that's what happened. And uh, yeah. I was in the UFC for sure. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's it's nice coming up as a pro in California because there's so many organizations that you can get experience in. Uh, yeah. My my final question before I transition to to fully. Uh, it's a pretty high concept question. Uh, there's a lot that could go into this, but you already kind of touched on it with that first sparring session with Randy Couture that, you know, to set up your shots, you were jabbing. Uh, yeah. And, you know, whether you realize it at the time or not, you know, jabbing to set up your shots is great because, one, you can, you know, get closer, and two, it usually yeah. encourages them to throw back at you, and then you have a window to their legs. So right. as far as, you know, wrestling, applying your wrestling to mixed martial arts goes, in the beginning, you know, how... How were you finding it with like your typical wrestling style? What was working? What wasn't working? And then by the time you reach what you would consider the peak of your career, you know what had changed? What became your your wrestling setups for MMA? You know how did you find your best attacks again? You know once you figured out the rest of the game. Yeah, in the beginning, <clears throat> I had trouble like um, uh, what it was like combining them together, mm-hmm. you know? transitioning transitioning from. Uh, striking to wrestling I had trouble with that because in the beginning it was like all just separate it was striking and then pause then wrestling you know mm-hmm. would jab jab and then pause and then shoot instead of like jab jab and then, and then like even if he tries to strike you know ducking under the strike and looking for the double like you know it wasn't that it was just like all right F it I'm just shooting you know <laughs> Or I'm just overhand right to a shot. You know, that's mm-hmm. that's pretty much how it was in the beginning. And then as I started getting um, better, I started, like, setting up my attacks with strikes, you know. And so as I started getting better in my striking, 
you know, I started like, you know, transitioning between striking and wrestling a whole lot more seamlessly, you know, so um, double double jab to the to the double leg, you know, or um, or, you know, one, two, three to a double or, you know, one, two to a high crotch, you know, different stuff like that, you know, mm-hmm. so um, those are the type of things that that I end up getting towards the end of my career. Um, and, uh, no one actually showed me any of that stuff. It was like all of that uh, had to come, you know, on my own, you know, mm-hmm. no one teaching striking the wrestling to me, you know, it was just, everything just came on my own really, you know? Right. So, um, so yeah, towards the end of my career, I was able to put a lot of those things together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a, uh, sorry, one follow up, just, uh, that's kind of like the the topic that I cover the most, like with my writing and the podcasting and everything is like is is those transitions because it's like kind of a an emerging art, and you have yeah. so so many amazing wrestlers in MMA in the UFC, yeah. and what I do is I look at how are they getting takedowns and how many of them seem to have a system for how they get their takedowns and how many of them are just fighting and they're learning yeah. how to fight and then they see oh I can wrestle right now and then they go do it and how yeah. many of them have you know, a plan. And it's so helpful yeah. to have a plan. So oh. I guess, uh, do you see that emerging with, with coaching? Do you see coaches teaching this now? I I teach systems all the time. That's, mm-hmm. that's what I do. And um, I call them series. Um, I have a striking and takedown series that I do um, on both sides, whether it's southpaw or orthodox. Um, and um, I call them the one, one punch, one punch, one punch, takedown series so right after your after your uh, right hand after your like if you're if you're orthodox after your right hand and they're uh, an orthodox fighter as well you could roll into your high crotch or you can roll into your um your double Mm -hmm. um their southpaw you can you can take your head to the outside for a double or you can put your head to the inside head to the chest single you know so there's different different ways and definitely there's footwork involved in it you know, because you can't just, you know, throw mm-hmm. without moving your feet. You got to move your yeah. hands your feet, you know, and engage your distance, you know. So, um, and, um, you know, I teach I teach that series, and I also teach my ground and pound series, too, you know. Um, I was able to, um, you know, do pretty well with my ground and pound, you know. And so, um, people, people just called me Donkey Kong. It looked like I was Donkey Kong on top, and so... Mm-hmm. Um, I played the Donkey Kongas a lot when I was in MMA, you know? So, um, so yeah, for me, like it was, um, learning, learning how to do that and, uh, freeing up my hands to be able to punch and using my hips as pressure on them Mm -hmm. as a, as a pivot point to, to throw my punches, you know? Cause I didn't want to like hold and punch at the same time. Cause that's impossible. You can't do that. That's why you see a lot of, a lot of guys not putting a lot of pressure in their ground and pound because they're not, they're not engaging their hips to be able to uh, free their arms so that they can rain down power punches on the ground. Mm-hmm. You know, and so that's the type of stuff that I show in different positions. Um, and, um, you know, and I have a series from there as well. You know, if he does this, you can do that. And, and um, you know, these are the things that I teach a lot of the guys I coach right now. Um, and they love it, you know, and they find <laughs> They find a lot of success in it. So, systems is the way the way to go, man. You gotta mm-hmm. have, you gotta know what to do, when to do it, how it works, why it works. You know, you gotta be able to know, on uh, transition seamlessly through different things when when the opponent defends. You mm-hmm. gotta know that stuff. Um, sure. If you don't, if you don't, then you're gonna be left behind. <laughs> There's gonna be a lot of other people that are gonna be very well equipped with a lot of great technique. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is all music to my ears. So people ask yeah. me a lot because I'm like, I write all these articles. So people are like, oh, like you, you, you offered this criticism and you like point these things out. Like, you know, where do you think wrestlers should be training? Like, who should they be learning from? And now I can say, you know, Mark Munoz <laughs> has has the right idea. This guy is is the man to man to go to. So I'll, I appreciate I'll send that, people man. to you, uh, hey, Philippe. Uh, this this has been awesome, but I want to pass it off to to Philippe because I've taken up a lot of time and you know <laughs> definitely gotten my my fill for sure. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Awesome, man. Thanks. Mm-hmm. No worries. What's up, what's up, Philippe? Yeah, what's up, Marco? How are you? I wanted to add something that you didn't say is that at some point in your career, your striking became better and more dangerous, that people yeah. actually shoot on you. 
And okay. from that spoiled position, you also created like a great uh, development of Guan and Pan, we can call like, for example, when you're in the front end lock and you spoil, you get to the body or even to the legs of your opponent. How did you develop yeah. this? Um, you know, I noticed that um, that in practice, because I used to own a gym called Rain Training Center, and in Rain, yeah. and in Rain there was there was amazing fighters. You know, Mo King Mo the Wall trained with me. Um, there was, um, dude, there were so many people. I mean, I'm drawing a blank as to who trained with me, but. Uh, <laughs> There are so many guys that trained with me in the UFC and in, um, you know, in Asia, one FC. And um, there was, there's so many good guys. Um, uh, so anyways, um, I, I had great training partners, you know. So uh, I noticed that in my ground and pound, I had, to, I had to switch it up and not just go for the face, but go for the body, go for the legs, go for the, go for the hips, you know, just whatever I can punch. It was kind of like playing the game. At Chuck E. At Chuck e. Cheese, there's there's this game called Whack-A-Mole. And uh, you have these paddles in your hands, and you're standing up, and every time a mole comes up, you got to whack it. You got to mm-hmm. whack it. You got to whack that mole. So whenever I take somebody down and I'm on, and I'm, and I'm ground and pound, I'm playing, I'm playing Whack-A-Mole when I'm on top. You know, wherever there's an open spot, I'm punching it and punching it as hard as I can. You know, so um, that's pretty much how it went. And and if they were blocking their body, I'd fake the body, boom, go over the top of the head. And then if they're block, if they're in on the single leg, the obviously I can't punch the face, so I'm hitting the legs. You know, so I'm just dismantling them. You know, as you know, and then when they get back to their feet, they can't walk too too well. You know, or being yeah. standing too well. So that's that's where I developed it. You know, I developed it, and because you get you get head happy, you know, when when you try to you try to finish the fight, you get head happy, but you know, you can't get to the head if you if they have all their faculties, you know, everything everything to their disposal because they can kick if they're in the guard, they can kick you away, you know. So you gotta pass the guard and start, you know, um, start looking for side control and then ground the pound from side control and then and then when they when they try to get a uh, guard and they settle for half guard, that's even worse for them. So, you know, so that's, that's where I like to go. You know, I like to, I like to, um, you know, have that system on top. And I developed that through all the training partners I had at range. Yeah. You had a lot of success with it. Like even Ryan Jensen, he tapped to strike and most of the yeah. strike, they were to the body, to the rib cage, which yeah. opened then the end. Like it's like in, Striking. So uh, this understanding of going to the body, the legs, and the head, I was wondering how much um, working with Rafael Cordero helped you also later in your career? Yes. Um, I, I trained with Kings, and Rafael Cordero was a great coach of mine. He, uh, he taught me um, his style of striking, and, um, you know, and then, and then I was open to a lot of other training partners with Kings, you know. Um, with Fabricio Verdum, Leodo, and and um, uh, Shogun, um, you know, there was there was a lot of guys over there that I was able to train with. You know, that helped me get a lot better too. Yeah, one of the the most uh, signature move of your career is the over over and right to pass the guard to let in side control. Yeah, which is something that Shogun used to do, but with his stomp kicks, is it something that you learned from him a little bit? Um, you know, with Shogun, um, it was, we were, we were sparring partners, but at the same time, we didn't, we didn't show technique on each other. It was all, it was all, uh, master, master Rafael showing us the technique. So really he was a, he was a sparring partner and, and, um, I taught him a lot. I taught him, I taught him wrestling stuff, you know, so I was coaching him and, um, uh, he didn't necessarily coach me um too much but uh but yeah i mean um there was there was stuff that that he would do that i would be like okay maybe i should do it like that and um you know um there was a time where where i was on top of him and and doing my ground and pound and um he would like do his jujitsu like he would do a homopada and you know and get out of a lot of things you know and so i learned a lot of things from him just by going with him because he was unbelievable i mean he's 
he's uh, an ex champion, man. I mean, he's, I mean, the best they come, you know, as yeah. a training partner. So, um, so yeah, um, I respect him and he's a good friend of mine. You know, earlier you mentioned that as you started wrestling at like 13 years old, you had to catch up the years that you didn't train to get on the same level as your competitors. Yeah. And in MMA, as you start maybe at like 29? I started 28? 29. Yeah. 29. So you had to catch up again with the <laughs> jiu-jitsu, the striking. And did you feel that experience to learn even wrestling a bit late help you? learn quickly other methods yeah so um i i started late and then thank goodness for uriah faber and ultimate fitness uh team alpha male over there in sacramento because uriah was the one that got me out um we had a good base of uh, people there that i was able to learn from and uh uriah is just he's a brother from another mother man i love that guy um he's <laughs> He's a guy that's uh, that I always, I always uh, will, would, I mean, cherish as a friend. He's a great, great friend. Um, so um, he he is the one that brought me out, and so um, I learned my base from from him and and the coaches he had on staff, and then over at Fairtex, and then when I moved down to Southern California, I had, you know, a lot of people here um, that helped me out as well. Um, there was, you know, Rafael Cordero, there was uh, Abel Nunez, there was Billy Scheibe, there was, um, I was a part of a lot of different gyms around here because I was trying to get the best training out here when I just moved out here. So, I mean, I would go to um, Body Shop with um, Antonio McKee. Um, I'd go to Black House um, yeah. with all the Black House guys with, Anderson Silva, the Nogueira brothers, uh, Junior Dos Santos, Rafael Dos Anjos, Leo Machida, like all those guys I was going with. And then I was going to the compound over in San Diego with Jason Lambert and, um, you know, um, a lot of different guys there. And I was going to Alliance with like Brandon Vera and, um, and uh, you know, Alex, Alex um, the Mahler. Um, you know, I was going with... Uh, Um, you know, all the guys over there, you know, so you know, there's a lot of different gyms I was a part of. And then um, uh, I was locally here around Orange County. I was training at a gym called Joker's, Joker's Wild Fighting Academy, where I met Mike Guyman. And Mike Guyman had a school there and, and um, it was local. So it was close for me. So I ended up training there as well. And he ended up uh, welcome, welcoming me. And then we ended up opening a gym called Rain. And um you know, uh, with our partner, Andre Julian, and then uh, we ended up opening that place up. And so, uh, yeah, that was a, f a quick kind of way of, for me to be able to, like, um, talk about my development through through um, MMA, but I always had my wrestling. <laughs> always yes. had my wrestling and, and to fall back on, and, and I was teaching everybody wrestling as I was as I was learning all of the stuff um, of, of MMA, you know? Yeah, of course, having all those different looks from all the good gym that there is in California, does it make made you even, like, for example, training with Fabricio Verdum made you, like, feel comfortable going to the Guan with, like, a Demian Maya, for example? Yes, and so he was a big part of my training, um, as far as going with Damien, because he knows Damien well, too, you know, and so I was yeah. with Kings, and, um, you know, I was going with Fabricio, and I, you know, I was going really well with Fabricio, you know, I was teaching him wrestling, and, and he was, he was going with me, and I was learning a lot, a lot of jujitsu from him, as far as MMA is concerned, you know, from an MMA standpoint, so, um, so yeah, so anytime I go with Fabricio, I mean, he, I mean, he's a wizard on the mat, I mean, he is, he is amazing you know and so um i learned how to do a lot of things from fabricio for sure i love that guy yeah because you even you even went to a dust choke against maya so i was wondering how confident you had to to be to to do that man I, my darces people don't know about my darces man i got a lot of darts i i used to call myself darth vader in uh, in practice you know so <laughs> So I was like, hey, man, be careful, man. 
you know, um, I got Darcy. But people know, I mean, people know here that I have Darcy. So I wanted to choke Damian Maya out, you know, and make a statement, you know. Yeah, that's the attitude. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I had it, though. And then, you know, he's, the thing is, he's the best that they come in jiu-jitsu, you know. So, um, so he knew, he knew the defense to that. And he, he went straight towards my legs instead of circling towards my head. So, so he, um, he's great. He's, um, he was good. And, but I had him gurgling. I had him, <laughs> I had him doing that, you know, uh, but he ended up getting out. So, uh, people, you- told, people told me don't take him down, but I'm like, no, I'm going to take him down. You know? And so I took him down a lot in that fight. Um, yeah. I went from striking to takedowns and, and I would do different takedowns to him. I do, I do my double leg. I do my, you know, high crotch run the pipe. I would do a lot of stuff to him in that fight. And it was a fight of transitions, man. I mean, he clipped me one time. He clipped me one Early, time. Early, one yeah. yeah. And I, and I kind of lost my footing a little bit. I was like, whoa, um, that's crazy. You know, and he, he caught me in the back of my head, but, uh, I ended up coming, end up, I mean, end up recovering and getting a lot better and taking them down again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was definitely one, one number two and number three were for you. But would you say that you were surprised that how good his striking was actually in one number one? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I thought he was just going to try to get me to the ground as much as he could, you know, like shoot, shoot in and then pull guard. You know, I thought that was, I thought that was that. That's what he was going to do, but but he didn't do that. He would shoot in, and then um, and then follow a strike. You know, I was like, ooh, he's got a different game plan. You know, so it was uh, it was a lot different than what I thought. But you know, I was prepared with all the training partners I had, and I was yeah. prepared to go wherever so, wherever. It went. Something that impressed me. I watched the fight again today. Something that impressed me was that often Maya he gets people on the ground like he shoot a double leg. And just stay and get to half guard and then get people from half guard. But you actually, you, you locked his ankle every time. So I figured that's something you get with the Verdum, that stuff that you put training with guys like him. Yes, yes. Um, because Verdum is the same way. If you go into their guard, oh, dude, you're done. <laughs> you're done. That's their, yeah. that's their web, man. And you're, you're, you're a moth flying into a, a spider web. Like, you can't do that. You know, and so um, I wouldn't fully engage their guard. I would take them down and I would stand over the top of them. And that's where I feel that I'm best at there, you know, and being able to use their ankles to pass their guard into punches, into strikes. Um, that's that was a series I was using, you know, um, to uh, to be able to um, fight against Damien. And uh, so you had like a crazy good career, a very inspiring career. I would like just to, to talk next with what I feel is the most inspiring thing you did is after the, the loss to Whiteman, you had like a foot injury that kept you out of training for a long time and you gained some weight and you had to go back to 185. Yeah. And can you talk about your training, your fight camp? You have to be a long fight camp to come back from the foot injury to making 185 and being in like maybe the best shape of your career yeah so um that that was yeah it was difficult it was hard you know i mean um i gained a lot of weight and um i'm not a guy that goes out and parties i'm not um because i have a family i don't drink i don't smoke i don't do any of that stuff but when it comes to food (laughs) I like to celebrate with food, man, you know, so, um, you know, and, and that's what happened is I, I wasn't fighting, but I was eating a lot and I wasn't training and I gained a lot of weight. Um, but naturally I was, I was walking around at two thirty, at two forty, going down to 185, you know, so I was wow. cutting a lot of weight already. You know, if I knew I had a fight coming up, um, Soon I'd be 215, you know, um, walking around at 215. But I, I, I shot up to 245, you know, and, um, you know, I had to lose all that weight. You know, I, I even shot up to 255, 265, you know, afterwards, you know. So um, I lost a lot of weight for that fight, but I did it well. And my, my strength conditioning, um, 
I worked with Sam Calavita, who is uh, with yeah. Training Lab. I also worked with um, uh, Todd Norman, who was my trainer as well, and he helped me tremendously too. So those two guys helped me tremendously. Um, I was training with uh, with Todd Norman, and he was he took before and after pictures. I mean, you could look it up, and he hashtagged the picture uh, hashtag obese to beast. Um, he actually hashtagged that hashtag and. You can look it up there, and then and um, Todd took before and after pictures of me, and and did a weigh-in, did measurements, and all that stuff before and after, and and um, yeah, I was in I was in the best shape of my life. I mean, it took five it took me five and a half months to lose uh, about you know 75, 80 pounds, um, but it was it was it was a grind, man. I remember in the beginning it was like hard for me to do anything. By the end of camp, I had a 20-pound weight vest that was strapped so tight I couldn't breathe, doing the same things I was doing in the beginning, you know? So, um, uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was great, man. It was, uh, you can look it up. I mean, everything's documented on YouTube um, of, of some of my workouts there. You know, because like a fight camp is tough enough <laughs> at first, but now getting back in shape and also working the skills at the same time, did you start more by dropping some weight and then working the skills of like, like a regular fight camp? So um, I did it. I did it kind of at the same time because you know, I was training because I had my gym and so I was training anyways. Oh, yes. um, but I was making sure I was putting in, getting in my strength conditioning with Todd. I was doing my, I was doing my, um, I was doing my, uh, my fasting cardio in the morning. I was intermittent fasting. I was making sure I was on a diet. Um, I ended up getting on a uh, food service called Sunfair. Um, shout out to Carl Farrell. Carl Farrell. He uh, helped me out with over at Sunfair. I was getting meals delivered to me, so I didn't have to worry about making meals. Um, so I was, you know, eating great. And, um, and losing weight at the same time because there was a time where I kept on my, um, my heart rate monitor and it tracked um, all the calories I was burning throughout the day. And there was times where I'd burn 8,000 calories in one day, you know? Wow. So, um, and that's, and that, I mean, that right there. And, and, um, and I was eating 1,500 calories for Sunfair. Okay. You know? So that, that, deficiency that I had was just the weight was just falling off you know so um, yeah, too. yeah so that's 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 what I did and I had to be disciplined I had to be dedicated I had to be uh, diligent and all of that stuff and you know something that I love even more than what you did is that so you won that fight against Tim Butch it's a great fight by the way for people who listen if you haven't catch the fight it's great back and forth very good fight Tim Butch was a great great fighter too yep and uh, you took on the mic, and the first thing you say, which is awesome, is that you said that as you did it, everybody can do it. Like it's yeah. something you could say, I'm the best at it, but no, you wanted to share the fact that everybody has some struggle and everybody can can work for it. And I think that's part of why people love you so much also. And oh, because yeah. you're always trying to impact life in a positive way. That's what you said during your retirement speech, actually. Yeah. And we're only five days. Today is May 11. We record this. We only four or five days short of your fifth year's retirement anniversary. Yeah. Can you talk about that last night in Manila, in the Philippines, uh, fighting Luke Barnett? Um, I guess it must have been an emotional night for you. Oh, yeah. It was very emotional. Um, so that's – it happened the, – the last fight um, happened to be my son's eighth grade year, and he wanted to focus on wrestling that year, you know, so – um, that was, that was a time I wanted to like focus on my family and, uh, it was time, it was time for me to retire. You know, when my son said, I want you to coach me and I want to join wrestling, I want you to coach me. And I'm like, oh man. And, uh, that just, that right there just, you know, that kind of said that, that was a straw that broke the camel's back. Right. I, I, I was, I announced my retirement after that. And, um, you know, and so it was, it happened to be in the Philippines and in the Philippines, that's, that's where everything started for me. My parents are from the Philippines, I'm full-blooded Filipino 
and um, there's over seven generations of my family still there. Seven. Wow. Seven. Isn't that crazy? So, yes, it is. Um, you know, so I mean, there's like, I'm like a great, 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 great uncle, you know? It's like crazy. Um, but anyways, um, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I had over 300 people that were my family that was in one spot, you know? And they were coming up to me, calling me Lolo. And I'm like, Lolo means grandfather in Tagalog, oh. is the native language in, in the Philippines. And I'm like, wait, I'm a Lolo. Wait, who's your parents? Who's their parents? You know, I'm like, how, how am I a Lolo, you know? So, um, it was, it was uh, overwhelming, but it was just overwhelming with love and support that I had from the Filipino community. So um, as I was walking around there, there was like people coming up to me and wanting to take pictures. It was like every five steps I couldn't walk. You know, it was, it was, it was awesome, the support I had there. And so it was emotional, you know, when after I got um, – John Anik gave me the mic. They never l- relinquished the mic, you know. <laughs> he gave me the mic, and I wasn't prepared. I didn't have a speech prepared, you know, and so I just spoke from my heart. You know, and, and um, I greeted uh, the Filipino people in Tagalog, which is the native language there. And and then, um, you know, I was after I spoke in Tagalog, then then um, he asked me questions. I answered the questions and then it was, it was just um, it was amazing. It was an amazing time. Um, I, I, I loved it and I'll always cherish it. I had to thank the UFC and Dana White and Lorenzo for everything, um, for trusting me and in, in, um, being a UFC fighter and and representing the brand. So, uh, so yeah, it was great. It was it was an amazing amazing time for sure. Yeah, on a on a personal level, uh, I heard that speech maybe on the times because it's something that I find very inspiring. And to to be honest, now that you're here. It's a speech that I listened a lot when I struggle with stuff. So I want to thank you for this. It's something yeah. that just put, you know, like when I feel down, I listen to it. I just want to go for a run. So I, I thank you for this. And uh, I wanted to ask my last question about this. Is that how proud are you that people recognize you for your great career in college wrestling, wrestling, MMA, but also for the fact that all you carry yourself as a champion and a generous champion all your life and work with like the anti-bullying uh charity stuff like this or is it important for you almost not just to be known as a winner but someone who's grateful and just try to help people uh thank you man thank you for your kind words yeah that's um that's what i feel that i've um that i'm here to do i feel that's that's my mission is to use my talents gifts and abilities to impact people in a positive way and and um you know from being a man of faith and having my family and my friends. So the three F's for my life are faith, family, and friends to be able to impact from around in a positive way. That's, that's, that's what I feel like I, my mission is to do in life, you know, and, and um, I still have my wrestling club where over 250 kids are a part of that. I'm able to do that every day. I have fighters over at the training lab that I coach um, that I'm able to impact um, and and be a part of their career, um, uh, you know, and so I'm able to do that. And, and um, you know, I have my anti-bullying campaign because in my life, I've, I've had a lot of experiences, right? And so like, your life experiences shape and mold you into who you are and who you become. Never thought about me being bullied, how it, how it, it would help me impact people, you know? So I'm able to talk about my my life about being bullied and rise above it and helping others get through it as well. So um, that's what I'm here for, you know. And um, I'm here to be able to um, to impact people and help people in, in whatever they they have similar experiences with 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 them going on in their life that I did have have happened in my life too. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mark, for joining us. For my part, uh, that's all I had to ask. I don't want to take too much of your time. Ed, do you want to say something before we, we stop? Yeah, just that this was amazing and that you were <laughs> an, an excellent guest. And uh, it's it's so cool that uh, I think, like, beyond everything else you said, uh, just in terms of, like, impact on the sport, 
Uh, one, you know, it's just your technical development and ground and pound, the way you wrestled, the way you did everything. Um, but also just uh, the way you carried yourself, like Philippe said, that you prove you can be a gentleman and still be very successful and, and do well financially in the sport um, as long as you're performing the cage and, and doing the right things otherwise. So that's a great lesson. I think there's a ton of great lessons to learn here for someone, you know, in the middle of their career, beginning their career, starting wrestling, not wrestler, whatever. So yeah. something to learn from everyone. And, and we love to learn here at the fight site. So that makes you uh, the perfect guest. So I, I really appreciated okay. this. Thank you, guys. I appreciate your time, man. Really mm -hmm. appreciate it. Thank you. Do you have anything to, like, shout out, plug? You know, where can people find you? Oh, yeah. I mean, if you want to follow me, I'm on Instagram, uh, you know, and Twitter at at, uh, at Mark underscore Munoz. Um, mm -hmm. You can follow me on Facebook on my fan page there, too, and um, at Mark Munoz MMA. Um, and, uh, you know, for those of you that um, are wrestlers, you could, uh, you know, look up the West Coast Wrestling Camp if you're in the California area or, you know, um, or you could go to the wrestling room, um, thewrestlingroom.com, and uh, you could go there to learn some wrestling techniques from me uh, on there as well. So, um, so yeah, you can find me at all those different places, um, and I usually try to get back to people as much as I can. So if, if I don't get back to you, just keep... Keep writing, and I'll get back to you eventually. So I, I will, I promise. But, um, but yeah, those are, those are, um, that's how you can get hold of me. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, and everyone who, who listens to my podcast, if you, if you do that, uh, if you're like looking for somebody to, to study or to learn from in terms of how you can, you know, get wrestling to work in MMA, definitely watch Mark Munoz. Talk to Mark Munoz, and he clearly has the mind for it. Uh, cool, Philippe. Do you have any uh, parting, parting thoughts? No, just saying thank you, Max, so much for the time. Was it was an honor to speak to you. Maybe we can speak sometime else. Yeah. That would be for, awesome. For sure. Lots Let more to know. talk about. <laughs> love, love to talk to you. Love cool. To you thank guys. you so much. All yeah. right. Peace out. Thanks. Have a great week. You too.